Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond. Thank you. <laughs> Chair of the Humanities Forum and uh, tonight's uh, Monday Night Philosophy. We started it here in 2009. Um, the pandemic hasn't always had us on Monday nights. Um, we've, we've been adjusting to everything else, but uh, we're, we have this program, which is kind of a culmination of a lot of the things that we've done before. So. That's the first thing, and uh, the speaker tonight uh, for Monday Night Philosophy is me. <laughs> so, so uh, and uh, I'll be talking about the revitalization of ancient Greek philosophy. So, uh, you're all very brave to come here in person to hear uh, that topic. I, I'm extremely impressed <laughs> that so many of you are willing to come out and listen to something about philosophy. Um, but I wanted to talk about it from the background point of view. So uh, this picture here, a famous picture by Raphael, is called the School of Athens. Um, and it was done in the Renaissance by Raphael. And it's a very cute picture. I won't go through all the identities. But he, he wanted to connect the Renaissance to ancient Greece. So uh, there's uh, Plato and Aristotle in the middle. And Plato looks just like Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> uh, Aristotle looks like another person. Uh, this, this is. Uh, Another one of the philosophers from that time looks just like Michelangelo, uh, and, and he put himself in the picture as well. So you can find online all the identifications. I think there's at least 15 people from the Renaissance that he used their faces to identify with characters from another time. And I think it's really important. I mean, obviously, the Renaissance has been influential. Uh, obviously, ancient Greece has been influential. I think it's really important to remember how few people actually are involved in this. Um, if you look back on uh, ancient Greece and say, you know, it, it's not like the British in the 19th century going to Greece, looking in all their grave sites, trying to figure out how big their skulls were to do all that work, you know. They, they, they thought that the skulls must be bigger or something. That's not it. it. Probably of all the writing that was done in ancient Greece that had an impact, it, it's not more than 1,000 people who did that writing. So in the Renaissance, it's not that much bigger. So. Uh, if we're going to have a revitalization, you're already, you know, 10% of everybody that's going to be involved uh, right here in person. So um, the idea for the revitalization for me is that you take the best part of ancient Greek thought and you combine it with 21st century science. And that will, I think, uh, give us much more strength in the project that we've all been working on, uh, those of us who spend any time on it, um, and that is... Here we have humanity on this planet, and there's, we now have eight billion of us, and everybody has their own explanation, their own intuition of what's actually going on. And if you just say your intuition to other people, you can either persuade them or not persuade them based upon how vigorously you are enthusiastic about what you say, or you know, how, if you have physical power over them, how you force them to agree with what you have to say. But this isn't, doesn't get us to some common ground about our reality that we all share. Now, there are people in India, for example, and other places who think that everything is an illusion that we see, so there's no common ground and there's no way ever to get there. But my answer to that is, even if it's an illusion, we can all still come to the common ground on what that illusion is. <laughs> so let's not worry about whether it's an illusion or not. That's not the crucial thing. So I think that the revitalization comes from a couple things. Pythagoras came up with this concept of a concept, basically. He saw a pattern. Now, a lot of people argue we just had a great program. Edward is here from our program, Pythagoras to Plato. Um, and it was clear that the Babylonians and probably the Egyptians already understood that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. What they understood was that you could figure out you know, what the length of the, of the um, diagonal was in a right triangle when you knew the lengths of the other ones. Now, but what Pythagoras did was he made it a concept. 
He made it a, a, an equation in this case in mathematics. And what Plato did was he had this fancy idea called the eternal ideas theory. Now, I think that that actually was an adjustment of the number theory of Pythagoras. And Plato was a Pythagorean. So I instead of focusing only on numbers, Plato said, well, there's probably these abstract concepts that, that are not concepts uh, because they didn't use that idea or even that, uh, that thing. These are eternal ideas. And our world is an imperfect world that's a bad copy of the real world, which is where all these perfect things are that don't ever change. And just, just to give an angle on that whole approach on both Pythagoras and Plato's part, if you're the first amphibian when you come out of water, you're going to still be wet when you're walking around on land. And, and both Pythagoras and Plato were, were among the first, not the first, but among the first. Every, reason has always been used, yes, but for minor things like, you know, how to catch the antelope and eat it. You know, and, and go after the ones that are lame, and use your use your reason to figure those things out. So reason's always been part of the human experience, but there's almost no evidence before uh, Pythagoras that reason was used as suddenly the way to try to understand. Now, what is that revolution in thought? Is if we're all going to try to understand our objective reality, and we're doing it based on each of our intuitions, where are we going to get? How are we going to persuade each other? But if you can do it with reason and explain exactly why this makes sense, at least you now have a clear theory. Now, that theory using reason may not last very long, but it will have a whole bunch of people looking at it, finding out where that reason doesn't work. Right? And so that's one of the great advantages of philosophy and having a philosophical attitude is you, you may like your ideas a whole lot, but if someone tells you where they're wrong, you, you like them even more and you're even happier with the new product because what you're looking for is an, an explanation that makes some sense. So uh, where, where people who are trying to force or, or persuade other people to agree with them because they feel more comfortable when other people agree with them that they have the right idea, they don't like it when anybody you know, says anything against those ideas which is exactly the reason that you know, philosophers are very unpopular uh, and, and have always been unpopular. Even after they're dead, they're unpopular. You know, that's <laughs> usually by the time you're dead, you know, you, you, people get a little more comfortable with what you did. Uh, but that doesn't work for philosophers because the ideas are there kind of eating away. Now, he couldn't possibly have meant what he said, you know, then <laughs> pushed aside. So those ideas... Uh, you know, uh, Plato's idea about eternal ideas, people look at that and they go, what the heck was he talking about? Because, you know, the, there's an idea of a man, and then these are all imperfect copies of men and women, and so on and so forth, trying to participate in the form, but not quite doing it, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it was, it's very personified of what those forms are, and in a little while I'll talk to you about how I kind of adjusted that theory a little bit. But what basically was is those were the forerunners, both of those ideas from different angles both Pythagoras and Plato's, are forerunners of our idea of the concept. What's an in inherent pattern in what we're doing? And if we find out what those inherent patterns are, we have a much better idea. Now, we think, I mean, there are people who say, I know what the blueprint is of the universe, you know, but it's pretty hard if you can't explain it. If you, if, you, if you stand up and you say, I'm omniscient, and someone says, well, how many ants are walking around over there, you know, in, in, in that hill, and they can't answer, you can doubt whether they're actually omniscient. And, and there is nobody who's ever been able to come back and say that they're omniscient or have an NDE and, and say, well, I was there. I knew everything in the universe. So, okay, fine. Do you have any medical advances for us? You know, do, do, do you know any specific facts? Well, no. I had the feeling of being omniscient. Well, no. We have a lot of people who have the feeling of being omniscient. Usually they're politicians. <laughs> and... and, and you know, at least at our age, we, we realize that that's probably not accurate. So um, let me talk a little bit about the outline of my ideas, but I just think that if we connect what we do know, or at least think we know, because our scientific theories aren't perfect either or proven. People throw around the idea of proof quite often, but nothing really is proven except for mathematical principles that the assumptions are very clear and, and 
you can prove a squared plus b squared equals c squared always for right triangles, right? It's always going to be true. You know that every time there is a circle, that the diameter in relationship to its circumference is always pi, 3.14, etc. Very precise, always the same. That's the kind of inherent patterns that math mathematics can do. So I'd like to give you a little outline of, of how I got started on this as a young man, well, as a kid. Um, I read Plato's Republic when I think I was 14, something like that. And I really like I really like this idea that if you get your first principles straight, everything else will fall into place. And that sort of guided me for all the time that I've spent on this. Now, very rarely will probably you find that the person who inspired somebody to spend more time in philosophy, you know, who, who did that? Who did that? Well, in my case, it was Johnny Carson. <laughs> it's true. And it, you know, I used to sneak down, don't tell my mother, <laughs> I used to sneak down in, with my older brother, and we used to watch his uh, monologue, and then we usually all went off to bed. It was in the Midwest, so it was only 10.30 at night. It really wasn't that outrageous behavior. Um, but in my family it was, but you know, in your family I'm sure it would have been perfectly fine. Uh, so we would sneak down and we'd watch this, and one of his dialogues one time, he started, you know how he used to make up scientific studies, you know, uh, those, uh, not none of the young ones, of course, have watched Johnny Carson, but uh, there's a lot of people here uh, who I'm sure have. Um, so he used to make up science studies, you know, like other people always do, but uh, you know, you catch him at it. But he made up this one. He said, oh, he said, there was a study done at MIT, and uh, they published it, and they discovered that the average male between the ages of 13 and 30 thinks about sex once every 30 seconds. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, you know, if I could just cut that down to once every 30 minutes, I'd have a lot of time for philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I credit Johnny Carson uh, for having given me a lot of time in my life for thinking about philosophy. So uh, I did a lot of work on this in my, in my 20s, in my mid-20s. And I'd like to give you a brief outline of some of those ideas. Uh, don't worry, uh, if I actually give you the long version, uh, I have, for each of these ideas, I probably have a lecture on file here at the Commonwealth Club from over the last 20 years. Uh, that's either in a podcast form or, or a live stream video from the last three years. Um, so each of the ideas can, and, and those, I thought those one hour lectures were very short. So, so I'm not going to take you through every detail, but I'm gonna give you an outline of why it is that I think that this combination of Pythagoras, Plato, and 21st century science will really have an impact and, and make it, well, I'm not saying it's gonna change the way we do things because the Renaissance didn't change the way human life lived. It, it influenced some people. Ancient Greece influences some people. A lot of our ideas, a lot of our science are based on that and so on. People will take uh, any idea and use it however they want to. So I'm not saying it'll ever be more than just not even 1% of the population interested in really thinking about it, but I think it's, this is gonna be a stream of thought in the cultural conversation because it has a lot of power behind it. So uh, this is, uh, this is a, an image, which I had a friend of mine uh, create to give an idea about what it was that I was up to. So the first image, uh, there is a pie up on the Parthenon, the, the, the deteriorated Parthenon. How many, how many people know why the Parthenon is in such bad shape after 2,000 years? I mean, 2,000 years is a long time, but the, it was in pretty good shape until, uh, until a, a military, there was a military uh, war between, I think it wasn't probably Ottoman Turkey and, and, and the Greeks, and uh, they, they, uh, put a, they thought it looked like a very good place to store your dynamite. Um, and and it, it exploded one time, and that's what blew out the inside of the place. Uh, but they've put it back together again. You see it's being restored, and that's, I like that, that whole idea. So, so I have here, uh, in, in shortened form, uh, Plato's, uh, that, that thing that I said before, get your first principles straight and everything will fall into place, the thing that I found the most interesting when I was 14. 
And I also put over here a little bit smaller what I've, I find to be the shortest version of undercutting one of the myths that uh, we all you know, have lived under uh, is by Mark Twain. He said, uh, Adam did not want the apple for the apple's sake. He only wanted it because it was forbidden. The mistake lay in not forbidding him to eat the snake. <laughs> and, and when you hear that, you say, yeah. You know, that's a funny joke, but it's also true. If, this, if, if God was omniscient and knew exactly what was going to happen, all he had to do was forbid him to eat the snake, and we wouldn't have had this whole problem. You know, so, so that's the kind of idea I love. In, and, and, uh, now, way back here at the back, I have political principles. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that I don't think anything. I think it's very important because... How we organize our society is very important. What the principles are, what the incentives are that we put in our system. Because just like any parent, you can either bring out the best in your children or you can bring out the worst in them by how you do things. So our political incentives are, are crucial. But people who think about ideas have lived under every kind of government and every kind of nonsense. It, almost every kind of government has some nonsense in it. So, so I don't think that's as important as what we do individually with our lives. I mean, politics is to make it easy for all of us to live as free lives and, and I mean, isn't that exactly what politics is? <laughs> as free lives to pursue our happiness as freely as we can and as successfully as we can without any kind of unfairness or anything. Yeah, that's the ideal. Obviously, it never gets anywhere close to it. So, so it's very important to me, and I've done a lot of writing on it, but I don't think it's as crucial as understanding ourselves. So I spent a lot of time trying to, to clarify things. And I, I, I studied with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi when I was in my early t late teens and early 20s. And he, he uh, taught uh, Vedic, uh, some Vedic uh, philosophical ideas and so on. And so I, I, I like those ideas, but I kept going back to Plato. And uh, I, I tried to take Plato's ideas and to clarify the Indian ones. And I was bouncing them off each other for years. And, and it was very interesting. They kind of broke each other. I mean, they, the, the, the arguments showed me the weakness in both of them. It was a very interesting experience. And I was about 25 years old at that time. And I realized what the platform, you know, it's like uh, um, Archimedes with his Eureka, you know. You, you need a place to stand so that the lever works and you figure out what's going on, right? And so that's where the Eureka comes from. So I need a, always a place to stand in these ideas. Lots of ideas that were very interesting, very useful. I picked through all, kind, all the philosophical tracks, all the religious tracks. That's what I spent my early 20s doing, like everyone else. And, <laughs> and I was looking for those nuggets that you, know, that you could work as something that would be stable. And when I was 25 and I was working in a library in, in my hometown, I thought I was uh, getting rid of all the books that, that, uh, that they hadn't used for decades, actually, quite a few of them. And uh, it, so it was not a, a mentally consuming job. So I had plenty of time to think while I was doing it. Um, and I realized one time that the problem with the arguments about time and eternity are that we're working with the wrong concepts. Uh, before I go any further, I want to explain a, that a lot of what I did was eliminate ideas from the past that were getting in the way of coming up with an answer. It wasn't so much, there, there are some new ideas, but there are more getting rid of one ideas and letting the other ones expand out into the space. And one of the ideas that was very popular in ancient times is the coexistence of opposites. How, how is our reality structure, where's the tension coming from? And one of the ideas that's most popular is the coexistence of opposites. So there's good things and there's bad things. You've all heard the argument that the only way to, to, to appreciate the light is to be in the darkness. The only way to, to really like goodness is to be evil. The only way to really understand what it's like to have a happy family life is to have a miserable family life first. I don't buy those arguments. I think that's, that's pretty clear. And so one of the things that I thought of was an analogy of where this actually comes from. And it comes from hot and cold, because hot and cold are supposed to be opposites, right? I said, 
Are, are hot and cold really opposites? Is that a really good way to look at it? And how I got there was from water. If you were trying to say ice and water and water vapor, you know, they're all different. They're all, they all fight each other in a way. You can't, have the same, you can't have water at the same time you have ice with the same material, so on and so forth. And the difference is the amount of internal motion, momentum that's inside the object. So I looked at that and I said, well, what's really common of all those things is H2O. Now it took a long time for us to understand that there are molecules at the basis. The, the ancients thought that everything's made of, of earth and fire and air and uh, water. And that, that all those different partial combinations explained everything. In medicine, there were humors and so on. People were looking at it. And it took a long, only about 400 years have we been thinking in terms of very tiny things that we used to not be able to see, right? And molecules, so we, I don't know how long it's been since we discovered H2O, but we know now there's this molecule that includes you know, hydrogen, two hydrogens and one oxygen, and the way that that operates based upon what the outside temperature is on it is what gives us ice and water vapor and water. So I looked at hot and cold that way, and I said, okay, are they really opposites or are they something else? They're like that. If you say that there's something objective, in this case it's temperature, what's the internal temperature of something? And it's, you can say, how all the parts of it, how fast are they moving relative to each other? That's the internal temperature. And another question off the side, which I won't go into, but is how do you define the ex external lines of any object either? You know, where do you say the box comes to an end? Because we know now that things are coming in and going out of everything. They're coming in and out of my body right now, and I'm not paying any attention to that at all. And I hope you're not either. <laughs> uh, but, but you have hot and cold, and, and so why do we say that they're opposites? Well, this is hot, and this is cold, and this is where we are. We're somewhere, our temperature is something. It's 98.6 degrees. So we say 125 is really hot. We say that 32 is quite cold. But if our temperature was 150, we'd have a different definition. The different definition would be 190 to be hot, and it'd have to be you know, 110 to be cold. And it's just relative to us. So what I liked about that was we have an objective reality and a relative perception of that objective reality. And what I liked about that is it just sounds like what I was aiming for, which is we all have our own intuitions about things, and then there's something objective out there, and we have our intuitions. Now, as soon as we see that, if somebody says, it's really cold, and you're feeling warm, you ask them, where did you grow up? <laughs> right? You know, we, we here in California, people complaining uh, of a winter day when it's you know, 47 degrees, uh, that, that that's too cold. They must be from Southern California. Another person that says, boy, it's really warm in the winter here, you know that they're from Wisconsin or Minnesota or something like that. And so it's a, it's a relative experience of an objective reality, and we can have very opposite points of view about it, and if we come back onto this kind of a framework, we can actually come to some kind of agreement. And it really doesn't matter if here in San Francisco, some people walk down the street saying it's cold, other people walk down the street saying it's warm. It's all right. We really don't have to fight about that, especially if we have that kind of an answer. So those are the kind of answers I look for. And now I'll go to the basis. Basis if you, with time and eternity is time is always giving us trouble. You know, we can't really figure out what the heck that thing is. Does it go backwards ever? Everybody wants it to go backwards. Everybody in math and physics wants it to go backwards. It's so easy for the charts and the mathematics. If it just went backwards, we could solve all kinds of problems. So, you know, it's supposed to go backwards in black holes now, the, the dream of lots of physicists. But I think that the fact that they think that it goes backwards shows that we've made an error, a logical error in trying to explain that. Because why, why do you say that time is going backwards? What's happening is a photon of light is trying to leave that, but it can't escape, and so it's brought back inside the black hole. It stays inside the black hole. Well, we know all about that on Earth. There's an escape velocity. And if you show something up, it, it, it's not going to leave unless it's got a certain velocity. And so, so if what we said every time something went up to the, to the uh, uh, outer ionosphere and then came back down because it couldn't escape, if we said that it's reversed down to the Earth, 
turn back time, you know, we'd be spinning all over the place with time on this planet because everything is doing that. So I think we need to, to look at those anomalies in our explanations and say, we probably made a mistake. And I think the mistake there is we've tied the definition of time to the speed of light. We think the speed of light is absolute. Absolute means it doesn't ever change. It's ironic because we know that when light hits water, it bends, it changes. We know that when stars are moving away from us, it, red, uh, it, it uh, red shifts their light. And if they're coming at us, it blue shifts their light. Now, it might still be the same speed all the time measured, but something's going on that looks exactly like everything else normally. So I think that, that concept is probably going to turn out to be an inaccurate assumption and that, that black holes are much easier to understand. And I think that the reason that it's, it's a problem is that we, we don't think small enough. As I said, only 400 years ago did we get to molecules. Now we think we got it with, with you know, gluons and, and uh, uh, quarks and so on. But we also know from Planck that you know, something's are quadrillions of times smaller than that. Quadrillions of times smaller than that. So one of the myths, of, I think, of the 20th century in physics is, is that if you can't measure it, you can't know it. We, we, we live our whole lives doing things that can't be measured. Do all those things not exist? No. Maybe we can't know them in proof form, yes. But that doesn't mean we can't have reliable evidence about things. So I took the idea of time and its conundrums, and I said, well, what if we just dropped that idea and looked at the continuum of change? What's the continuum of change? And say, now, just like the switch to, to, to uh, water molecules, you say, instead of time and eternity, because the interesting thing about eternity, all the versions of eternity that we've heard, it's all like time is totally different in eternity. What does that mean? You know? There's not supposed to be any time in eternity. And if you say that there's no time in eternity, then you say, well, then nothing's going on because there can't be any changes. No, that's when this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. Well, if it all happened and one thing came before the other, then there is a process of change going on. And therefore, that's not a good definition of it. Now, it's, it's not, I like everybody trying to come up with the explanation of things. That's, that's fun. But that's not convincing because if you take the continuum of change, you say, we're being fooled all the time by our perceptions, right? We, we have this visual memory. We visually remember our, remember our childhoods in this home, a particular home. And we think when we're 70 years old that we can go back to that home. Well, that home is burned down, you know? <laughs> and and it, all of the atoms that were part of that home are gone, but they're not gone, gone. They're doing something else. It's almost like, you know, they're on their 15th career since, since, since they used to be in my house. <laughs> sort of like me. <laughs> so so if, you, if you look at it that way, you say, well, where are all those things? Well, they're always in the present. They're always in the present. Everything that is is always in the present. So it's, it, it doesn't, nothing gets outside the present uh, tense. The past is a, a former state of the present. The future is a, a future state of the present, right? Uh, but the stuff is all right here. Well, what does that tell us about what our objective reality is that we're all trying to understand together? Well, we're not all trying to understand. Most people are busy doing other things, but those of us who are trying to understand, there's an objective reality there. So if the continuum of change is like that, how do we understand it? So one of the analogies I came up with uh, years ago was that it's like a snow globe, you know, those Christmas snow globes. So there's a globe, and inside the globe are all the snow, and there's figures and stuff like that, and it's all solid. And then you shake it up, and everything runs around, runs around, runs around, runs around, then settles down, and then stops, right? It's very much like entropy, right? The theory of entropy, that everything is moving in the physical world towards a state of heat, death, whatever you want to call it, where, where no work can be done. There, there's almost no influence over each other of the small particles. So what if we thought, what if those atoms that the Greeks hypothesized were indestructible were quadrillions of times smaller than we think they are right now? Quadrillions of times smaller, but at the level of Planck's constant or less, and they are indestructible. They, because 
That's the stuff of the continual present. And they're continually being reorganized. The interesting conclusion from that is there has to be an exact number of those things. And I don't want to ask anybody to, to sign up to count them for us <laughs> because it's got to be in the decillions, right? You know, and decillions are a pretty big number. Uh, because we know, we have an idea of how big our solar system is now and how big the galaxy is and how many galaxies there are. And we have this big bang theory, which probably happened, a big explosion, but you know, where did the explosion come from? Did that come out of nothing? There's no explanation. But what if, what if there were black holes, a big black hole, that could compress those quadrillions of times smaller particles into a really tiny thing, just like any other thing. And it, all that momentum that was going on gets so compressed that eventually it'll explode again. That's exactly how explosions happen. Now, the interesting thing about that, that's just, I didn't really want to talk about black holes, but I'm, it's so much fun. Uh, if it's really a vacuum in which the black hole explodes, the stuff would go in all directions. All the directions that were going on, that were, that were covered, all the parts would go in all directions. Now, when we're looking back at the Big Bang, we are looking through a light cone that you know, just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we know that that's got to be a, what we see, what we know, is a much smaller percentage of that whole explosion than you can imagine, under 1%, no, no doubt. So we think of it as the whole universe created by the Big Bang. But our logic should tell us that that's a very small portion, and there might be other ones. So the interesting thing about that is, as people say, you know, we only can know what we can measure. But you have to be able to use logic like that to say, well, we measure this, and, and all of our theories are based upon some kind of extrapolation to say, we see these uh, mountain stone in the stones in the mountain. We know so much about what happens with stones and how they're formed that just by looking at those stones, we can look back in the past and see that this is 100 million years old or that's 300 million years old or even older. The interesting thing about all that is what we're seeing right now is we're not looking into the past at all. We're not looking into the past when we see the results of the Big Bang either. We're right here in the present. We're right here in the continual present. What we're seeing is something that's happening right now, photons that are reaching here, and we're amazed because we know that they've been traveling for 13.6 billion years, and we have our theories to explain that, and it might be adjust, adjustment over time in, in those theories. But the basic idea is pretty good and, and, and fairly well established, not proven, but lots of reliable evidence that something like that is a good explanation of our physical world. Well, but it's still all in the present and extrapolated with our theories. And so even those who say we can't know anything unless we measure it and still believe that, they're, they're, they're not living by their faith. Because okay. they do all kinds of things with ideas to extrapolate what we do know into an explanation. So we have this continual present. What does that make time? Well, time is just our arbitrary measurement of that. It's very arbitrary. And when we're, we're enjoying ourselves, the time moves by very quickly. And when we're having a bad time, it goes by very slowly. So those who want to live a lo really long life sometimes say, I'm going to have a really miserable time so that it seems like it takes forever you know, <laughs> to get to the end. And that's a really good example <laughs> of whatever your idea is, people will misunderstand it. They will always try to apply it to themselves. And so... Uh, so that's one of my favorite qu anonymous quotes. It says, an idea is not responsible for the people who believe in it. Because uh. <laughs> always, everybody's going to adjust it. So, so you take this idea, and then what was really interesting to me is, so what does that make eternity? If time is just an arbitrary thing, is eternity arbitrary, or what is it, you know, compared to this continuum of change? And I thought, well, the fascinating thing about eternity and the theories of perfection and the absolute and all that kind of thing that have been coming down to us from all different traditions is that it's perfect and it doesn't change. And I thought, well, yeah, that's very interesting. But if it doesn't change, it's either nothing, you know, or, you know, it doesn't have a personality. It can't express itself in thought. It can't express itself in words. If it expresses itself in words, it said one word, and then the next word, and then the next word, right? And that's a change. So it's part of the process of change. So I thought, what if the definition of eternity was 
uninfluenced by the continuum of change. Anything that's never influenced by the continuum of change. And that means that pi is eternal. And a squared plus b squared equals c squared is eternal. And then when I saw that, I said, okay, those are the inherent patterns in our reality. Those are the things we can actually describe, explain to each other, and say, look, there are some patterns. Now, I think that we have patterns in our personalities and in our emotions that are, have exactly the same character, but it's easiest to see in math. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's the, the start. So the coexistence of opposites, as I said, I started out, I threw that idea out. But when I saw this thing about eternity, I said, you know, that means that there's no reason, and there's, you know, not only no reason, there's no evidence that anything was ever created. If nothing was ever created, what, what, what do you need a creator for? In fact, he's, he's out of a job. So, so you look at it and you say, now, we're faced with a very weird idea here. First, we're, we realize eternity does exist, even from a mathematical and science point of view. That's a real thing. Eternity is a real thing. There, uh, there are things that are uninfluenced by this continuum of change, which we all experience. So we can't avoid eternity, but can we understand it a little bit better? Can we, can we get a hold of it a little bit better? Not easily, because this idea, just to show you that I keep thinking, just, just on February 24th, I came up with another subsidiary argument for this idea, an idea that I've had for 45 years about how to explain things. And, and I call it the uncreated idea. And I think we, we rely on common sense a lot um, as part of our reasoning process. But I think common sense has no basis for thinking that things get created and destroyed. Well, we know that, that, that mass and energy are co both conserved and they're conserved together. They can transform into each other, which is a very interesting thing. You know, e equals, uh, e equals mc squared means energy and mass can get converted into each other. That sounds a lot like ice and water and water vapor to me. I think there's probably some idea like, like the water molecule that's at the basis of both mass and energy and that will help us understand both of them. And I have an idea, just a big one, that everything that's moving relative to us at the speed of light is what we call energy and everything that's moving at our speed we call mass and everything that's in between we, we, we have has some mass and some energy. But it's probably all one substance. It's probably, in my opinion, I think it's probably all those atoms, those quadrillions of times smaller atoms that are indestructible that are moving in momentum. Now, just an aside, if that's true, then the wave particle theory about light is just that, you know, photons, which look extremely small to us now, but they don't look small to something quadrillions of times smaller than they are. If it's, if it's trillions of, of, of the real atoms moving together in a wave, then sometimes they would look like, an, uh, like a, a solid object and sometimes they'd look like a wave. So just a hint, that, that, that's another idea over at the side. Um, so the idea of perfection and good and the absolute also take out. Now that's the idea where I took the Vedic ideas and the Greek ideas and put them together and it showed me both the good in Plato's idea and the absolute in the Vedic ideas were probably getting in our way. Oh, maybe not. Maybe somebody will come up and explain to me exactly why that's not true. But that's the way it's been looking to me for 45 years. So I thought, you know, I've been testing that theory for quite a while. Um, so the interesting thing about those things that we get rid of um, is that it, if it sheds clarifying light on the other things, it can be really helpful. So those are some of the pillars. The thing that's left in life as an eternal democracy, which is one of my ideas, uh, is where does the life form come from? Where does our life forms come from? Where does our enjoyment of life come from? Where does our experience of life come from? If everything are these indestructible atoms that just follow rules towards entropy. Because all life is anti-entropic. It's localized. And, and it actually creates just as much entropy as anything else. But it does it at a faster speed because it's brought together in a way which is anti-entropic, but around it, it creates more entropy, faster. But we don't care, as long as we get to be alive, right? Is anybody really crying about the fact that entrop uh, entropy is moving faster uh, outside of the planet because of what we're doing here? It is a form of pollution. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're having an effect on the whole universe by what we do. But there is some force that pushes back against it. 
And I'm not going to be in a situation of just saying human beings are the, are the source of all that because, you know, one of my favorite examples is ants. If you go outside and you see an anthill and you see all of the particles and stuff like that around the anthill, you, you know that was not by accident. You know somebody did that on purpose. And a- ants did it on purpose. Now, we can argue about whether they're a hive mind and all that kind of thing, but they have something which is an anti-entropic force which pushes against entropy. And obviously we do too. And, and we build all kinds of cool things, including the Parthenon. So um, our push against entropy also has to be explained and it doesn't matter whether we can't measure it. We just have to have an idea. How, how does that make the most sense? What's the most reliable? So indestructible atoms, they're probably I- exactly, again, if there are minds, if there's one mind that pushes against entropy and we're all, we're all automatons attached to it without any free will, that's one thing. But actually, it doesn't make any difference what it is because it's co-eternal with the physical universe, whether it's a one mind or decillions of mind, the same argument applies. That force, which is anti-entropic, is part of the continual present at all time. Because if, w- if it wasn't there, if it was part of an accident, if it's just an accident because of how the atoms, indestructible atoms, came together in a particular place, then we would all, you know, given how many, how much time has gone on, it's, 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 there is no beginning to it, so we're always in the present. It's been going on a long time. We'd always be just in an entropic mess uh, without anything around. And since that's not true, that means something must be co-eternal. Something must also, the anti-entropic force must be co-eternal with those objects. Okay, so now, is it one individual and we are all part of it? Or is it all of us being independent? I think the lie, I'm not going to go into the logic, but I think the logic points to life is an eternal democracy, that there are decillions of anti entropic minds. Most of them are like ants, you know, and then there's these curious things called human beings who are a little bit more curious about what's going on around them and are trying to figure it out and, and explain it to each other. So that's another part of the theory. Now, what I did with that is I said, okay, what does this tell us about our personalities? Can we, can we do the same thing in understanding our personalities? Can we do the same thing in other ways? So I've talked a lot about that at the Commonwealth Club. I have, you know, uh, different, what I call, you know, the same thing. It's, a, it's an inherent pattern in the way we do things. What's the inherent pattern in happiness? Well, to show you that it's not a prescription for certain behavior, because that's never that never works. You see, if I, if I go back to another idea uh, that I got rid of, is that if there is no perfection, we're trying to aim at a certain kind of behavior and a thought and so on and so on, that we just I- exist and it's up to us what we do with this, um, then where do all these rewards and punishments come from in all the explanations? Rewards and punishments are an indicator that whoever made up the explanation is just like the rest of us, we're always giving other people around us rewards and, and, and punishments to try to make them do what we want them to do rather than what they want to do. If they do what they want to do, they don't need a reward and they don't need to be punished. Right? It's only when we want them to do what we want them to do that we reward or punish somebody. So we should be a little suspicious about anybody that offers reward or punishment you know, because they're just trying to bring us into their way of looking at things. If we look at, say, NDEs, uh, one of the th- interesting things about the 20th century is that there was a big increase in the near-death experiences that people have because of our medicine keeping people alive after they've died or bringing them back after they've died for a short amount of time. Um, and the interesting thing is that almost all those people experience beings of light, is how it's called. I, mean, I could go into all that, but it's fascinating because if we have a mind that's an anti-entropic force and it is something which exudes light, photons. It doesn't have to be, you know, th- this is something that maybe is physically explainable, you know, by physics. Because we might be minds that have some kind of structure, but not a biological body, and that we emit light. We know that atoms last a long time, shedding tons of photons all the time, and, and we know that they can last millions and millions of years. Now. I'm not going to get very excited about that, but 
you know, if that's what we are, uh, then all the things we say about that experience also falls into the category of everybody's intuition and nobody's logic. And so we don't really know what anybody's experience is. And so that's why my favorite of all these experiences that people have talked about is it, it, it happened in Marin County. I mean, where else uh, <laughs> would, would this have happened? But in Marin County, there was a guy who loved to ride his motorcycle, and uh, he happened to be uh, a disciple of a, of a Buddhist guru. And uh, he got in a terrible accident and, and was in a coma for three months. And when he woke up, he said, I, I, I had... I was alive the entire time I was thinking, and I, my guru was telling me that I had to go back into my body so that I could carry on his work and teach what he, he had wanted other people to learn and so on and so forth. I was trying to convince him to do that. And then he said, I also met this sort of angelic being, female, I thought, but I couldn't quite tell, who kept telling me, yes, come with me. It's time to move on to another world. It's time to move on. He said, and they fought over me for three months. And I thought, okay, you know, that's fun because that's just like our world. You know? and, and if you think about it, and I'm, you know, a lot of people, when they, they want a new explanation, they want it to be good news. This is good news, but this, this isn't good news. <laughs> if that's the way it is, that's all our neighbors and so on are the ones on the other side, our grandparents and everything. You didn't listen to your grandma tell you who to marry. You didn't listen. Now, now, if you go on the other side, they're going to they're gonna say to you, oh, this is what you should do, this is what you should do. And of course, it's probably overwhelming. I, I think of it a little bit like, you know, if, if you're not expecting it, and, and suddenly you're there, and somebody says, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, of course, that the universe is designed to teach us all a lesson. And you know what that lesson is? Let me tell you. And then they take you over. You know, it sounds just like you're walking down the streets in L.A., outside the Scientology Center. <laughs> and you're not feeling very good. <laughs> and they come out and they say, you know, you look like you're a little depressed. You're not used to this. Come on in, I'll, I'll explain everything to you. So I only use that story to make sure you're skeptical. <laughs> um, so if we, if we can get this sort of not the blueprint of everything, but at least some more of those ideas that really don't get affected by the continuum of change. I think we can understand life a lot better. We can know, you know, almost everything we do is, is in the pursuit of happiness. But why? What is happiness? What's the pattern? And when I was thinking about it back in my 20s, I thought the pattern has to include the concepts that will work for everybody. It's easy to say, you know, happiness is ice cream. Because, you know, almost nobody disagrees with that. But that's, that's not a really good definition. So, so what is it that really conveys this? Because you've got, to, you've got to look at a cat that is teasing a mouse before it eats it and is enjoying that process and say, that's also happiness. You have to look at a criminal who co commits a crime and says, I got away with it, and enjoys that process. So what is it that's true about all that? So the, the pattern that I saw is that happiness is the emotion caused by the fulfillment of a desire. If you fulfill a desire, you're happy. If you don't fulfill a desire, you're unhappy. So we think of happiness and unhappiness as opposites, but actually two out of the three parts of both of those emotions are exactly the same. A desire is involved, and it's an emotion. The only difference is, is if it's fulfilled, fulfilled or not fulfilled. And one of the things I also saw was that motives, what our motives are for everything that we do, are also desires. That's our, our, our real desires, actually. You don't really care too much about the ice cream. You care about feeling good about the taste buds and this, uh, a bunch of other things. Or you want somebody down the table, another kid that doesn't have ice cream, to be jealous of you. you know? Or all those other motives that make you happy. And because we have usually 100 motives for everything, we almost never have perfect happiness. Now, one form of perfect happiness is playing in the mud when you're a child. Because you really only just want to play in the mud. You, you don't have a lot of complicated emotions for it. And so that's what I call pure happiness, uh, where there's just no complications. And it's ironic because it means that the motive of wanting to be happy, the desiring to be happy, is the purest motive in the pursuit of happiness. Now, people will say, wow, okay, so what about virtue and all these rules and everything? Well, what's fascinating to me as part of the patterns that I saw 
was that the quality of our desires is actually totally related to the quality of our emotions. The, what we choose, it's not like when you want to get everything that you want in life, it's not that you have to go out and get a billion dollars to do it. The, the much easier way to do it is to be very clear about what you desire, about being very intelligent about what you desire. That's a whole theory I call intelligent desiring. That's another one of my things. That you, you, you go about this process of pursuing happiness intelligently so that you're not undercutting yourself all the time, which is what most of us do, because we have motives that are in, in conflict with each other. Not opposites, but in conflict. So I've talked about our personalities, tapes, hours, hours on, on tape and stuff like that. So I'm going to pass that by a little bit more and talk about another idea I have called Imagination's Horizon. So we see as far as we can imagine. And we're always imagining who we want to be, where we're going next, right? And one of the great ironies of life is, you know, this is who I want to be. And when we walk around and deal with other people, we're all going, see who I am? That's who I am. And the great irony is, if anybody buys that, you immediately discount their perception. You know right away that they, they, they don't see things clearly. And so you don't believe them. So all that psychological effort we put into trying to get people to believe in that is always going to not work because we're smart enough to realize we're lying. So, so that's one part of it. But the other part of it is that whatever you achieve, if you can see further, your imagination is going to go out and the horizon is going to go out further. And what we really don't understand are the things past our imagination's horizon, what we can't see. And I think most of these big explanations that people have given are out past our imagination's horizon, and that's why they don't make sense. But the irony of it is, you can either be happy about that or miserable about that, that you're not who you want to be. You can say, of course my imagination's gonna tell me where to go next, and so on. And that could go on forever and, and delight me, because there is no end to that process. You could say, I want to be the best weightlifter ever, and then you go all the way down that road, and you've made yourself the world's best weightlifter, and you've achieved that, and then you say, and on top of that, I want to be the fastest long-distance runner. And then you say, oops, it's pretty hard with the body I've just developed to do both, right? And there's all kinds of things in life like that, so that you can say at this point when you've achieved that, well, now I'm done with that, now I'm going to go over here, but now I have to train my body in a totally different way, and it's going to take me a long time to get to that one. So your imagination keeps moving around, and that's why people who spend a lot of time trying to become a millionaire, you know, not too many months after they become a millionaire, for those who actually get it, they begin, well, I should be a multimillionaire. Because there's got to be something to do. You know, you, you always have to move on. And that's why I also think you, you can't explain life by giving it a purpose, by saying, the purpose is to be a billionaire or a billionaire. The purpose of life is to get to heaven. The purpose of life is to get to enlightenment. The purpose of life is to get to nirvana. Because what do you do when you get there? Once you're there, your life has no purpose anymore. So that can't be a good explanation. It's a temporal thing. So the purpose, if you want to call it that, has to be inherent in that just the way we go about our desiring, it has to be happiness. It has to be trying to fulfill our desires. That's inherent in the way we do everything. It's really inescapable. And the interesting thing is, for a lot of people who, who, who pursue spiritual goals, as, as the ones that I mentioned, they, they feel um, that they could be, some of them have a plan of getting there by being miserable now so that they can get it later. And, and if you say, well, you're still pursuing happiness, they say, no, 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 I'm pursuing this. Say, well, if heaven is so going to be uncomfortable and un, you know, unappealing, would you be doing this? No, 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 of course not. No. They're, they're trading off a current pain in order to get that pleasure. So they're still pursuing happiness. And I think if you can analyze anything that anybody pursues and realize at some point in the process of their pursuit, they're expecting to get happiness out of it. But the quality of happiness, as I said, to based on the quality of desires, and I won't talk about that in detail, but it's fascinating sort of subject. Um, and the interesting part about it also is that 
the reason we haven't seen the connection between the quality of our desires and happiness is because almost everybody's explanation includes that obedience is a very big virtue. It's very important that you obey exactly what I just said. Right? No, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the people who explain it that way. It's very important that you obey what I just said because they're going to reward you and punish you based upon how good you are at doing what they said because their goal is for you to do what they want you to do so that you can become like that. And it's really interesting because like, you realize in this kind of approach, if life is eternal democracy, that the idea of desiring for any other mind is, is a false step. It's not really what, what you can do. The one good thing about, the good news about this is that we're all indispensable to ourselves. We're the ones who make all those decisions. And even if we've decided to obey somebody else and have done it for our whole lives, we can always say no. There's always our inner two-year-old, you know? <laughs> they can say, no, no, I'm not going to do it anymore, you know, after all that time. No. And, and then you're done. You're done. You, you, and you might have to die for it. I have plenty of experience with that. So... So, it, it, but, but you can always say no. You can always say no, and that's the interesting thing. So, that's, that's one thing. Um, there's lots more ideas, uh, obviously. Um, obviously, only because I've given so many talks o on, on, on each of them over time, and I've written lots of books about it. Um, but, but since I, I, I turned 70 today, um, and the Psalms uh, think that that's the end. <laughs> The Psalms said three score, 10 years. That's, the, that's how much time you get. Um, I'm hoping they're wrong. <laughs> um, but, but also I figure, you know, everything I do from now on is gravy. Now, I understand that's a very weird thing uh, to say for a vegetarian, uh, <laughs> that, that everything else is gravy. But, but, you know, I was raised on meat and potatoes. I had plenty of gravy. That's how, that's how my 11 brothers and sisters and I were fed. Uh, so. I think we, we, we have time to discuss this. We have an idea, but I also want to be a little bit more honest about it. You know, you, 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 lots of people here have heard me speak about these things over the years. And I wanted to say, you know, why do I think, why am I so confident that this is going to have an impact? Now, I don't think it's going to have a, a big impact and a noticeable impact, but I do think, and of course that's what I'm working for, to get it into the cultural stream, you know, right next to ancient Greek philosophy, updated version with, with uh, you know, some of the ideas thrown out, some of the ideas clarified, so that people can argue about it. And as I said before, one of the great things about when you work in philosophy is that you win no matter what happens. If somebody comes along and says, interesting ideas, here's where you're wrong, bam, you're done. You say, good, now I'm on your page because you've explained to me exactly what I had wrong. So now I have an even better idea, which is exactly why I said this to everybody, so that somebody would volunteer, and I don't even have to pay them, you know, <laughs> to fix my problem, to fix my thing. And if the ideas work, well then, I'm hoping that they will, we will stop scaring ourselves silly so much. You know, we do this to ourselves because we, we accept other people's intuitions based on their fears. And if we don't have those fears, you know, I can understand the people who have the same fears, sounds really good to them. But if you don't have those fears, don't be convinced because it's really just a projection of their fears. And even in, in a big sense, what I said before about the quality of your desires and the quality of your emotions, th that relationship, I think you know, one of the more interesting ideas uh, in, in psychological science is projection. That we take things and we project them out on the world all the time. And I think this is where justice comes from. We all know life isn't just. It's very, very clear. It's not fair. Um, and we complain about it all the time when it happens to us. Uh, and so, why? But if, if, if there's something in our heads, you know, that is a relationship between the quality of the way we do things and the quality of our emotions, that looks a little like justice. And so we want it to happen in the physical world, but it's really only happening in our minds. And so, we, that projection. And so, it seems to me that instead of trying to create justice and equity, and I know this is a big thing for a, a lot of people, everyone works on it in politics, as I said, at least talks about it talks about it. It's a nice shield. Um, but I think another way of looking at it is, total, is, is, is much better. You say, there's no such thing as justice. There's no such thing as equity. 
There's all millions of minds in our country all trying to pursue happiness. How can we make that work better? What would be wise to do in structuring the incentives? What would be wise? Not what would be just or equitable, but what would be wise so that more people can fulfill their desires? That's, that's a, a, a huge shift. Um, and, and when you think about it that way, the golden rule sort of encourages that justice and equity idea. So I thought about the golden rule. I said, well, that could use revision. <laughs> And the, the way I look at it is, it's, 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 you could say, be more generous to others than you would ever expect anyone to be to you. Because one of the things that we want in life, and that's we never get, one of the many things we get, like, is to be indispensable, right? I even knew lawyers who thought they were going to be indispensable to their law firms. How did that work, right, Charlie? <laughs> you know, you know. Nobody's indispensable, especially when certain people are in charge. So, you know, you're indispensable to yourselves. Nobody else can make your own decisions or think your own thoughts, no matter what they do. Even if somebody is really good at reading your mind, all they're doing is reading, you know. And so it's the same thing of saying, you didn't, you didn't write the book, you're just reading it, you know. So an author could say, well, okay, a million people read my book, but nobody's in my mind, right? So it's the same thing. Nobody's ever in your head thinking your thoughts. So you have that. That's your inviolable space. Nobody can do anything to it. You're indispensable to yourself. And that's true whether we are long-lived or we're not long-lived, right? Because when we die, there's only two possibilities. We die and we're gone, and we really were just a projection, or as they say, of this physical body. And if we're just a projection of this physical body and the body dies, we're done. We're gone. But you know, if you're gone, you can't be unhappy about it. You can't, you can't be sitting there going, I'm so unhappy, I'm dead. Because you're not there to think that, to feel that emotion, or to feel anything. And you can't, and you can't be happy that you're dead. So finally, that's over. You don't get that satisfaction either. So no matter what you think about life, you don't get the experience if that's it. So there's nothing to be afraid of because you're not going to experience it. Fear is the emotional anticipation of unhappiness. That's, what, that's the pattern, I see. So you're only afraid if you think that something's going to make you unhappy. If you see death clearly like that, it can't make you unhappy because you're not there. You're either not there or you're there. And if you don't like yourself, you might be afraid of it. Because you say, wait, wait, wait a minute, I didn't want myself to continue. I wanted to be dead. Those are the only people in trouble. Everybody else, and most people are really pretty, you know, safe. Almost everybody kind of likes themselves. In fact, a lot of people spend a lot of time explaining to themselves why it's so good to be them rather than anybody else. <laughs> and that's the reason why our heroes are much more popular once they're dead. <laughs> because once they're dead, you can always say, he was really great or she was really great, but I'm alive and she's dead. You know? And so you've, you've got the advantage over that person, and that's why their popularity goes skyrocketing as soon as they die, because they've now given everybody an explanation of why it's better to be themselves than to be that hero. So, for some reason I'm running out of time. Uh, <laughs> so, I have, I have been keeping for, for 50 years secret, not from everybody, but from lots of people, um, because my secret is socially unacceptable. Of course, that's what secrets are, right? The things that you don't want everybody else to know. And so, uh, part of the reason that I have the confidence that I think I can do this launch is because I've done it before. I, I have the memories that I've done it before. I, I know that I have, and I know what I did wrong, and I know I'll probably do some more wrong things. <laughs> but I think I can influence things with my enthusiasm for this kind of thinking. And so, um, my problem is that, and, and my secret, is that I have a drinking problem that almost nobody knows about. It's a serious drinking problem. It's not the same as the usual, though. Okay. Those of you who know me think, what, drinking problem? He doesn't even drink alcohol at all. So, so what does he mean he's got a drinking problem? Well, I have a drinking problem. See, most people drink to forget, and I don't drink so that I remember. And, that, and that's actually much more socially unacceptable <laughs> than the other one. 
And, and my problem is, long ago, I began to not follow the rules of drinking from the river Leth when you pass away. You know, it's supposed to take away all your memories. And so I have a memory that's stuffed with information about all kinds of things. Lots of them are painful, some, some of them. And I have been writing a book about it. Anybody who wants to, you see now, it's very socially unacceptable, so you don't really want to get involved. Uh, but if you do, um, you know, I, I obviously being socially unacceptable, you think, okay, you know, should I or shouldn't I? Well, I've been saying that for 45 years to myself, and I wonder about it. But I, I have a 20,000 word chunk uh, of the book uh, completely ready, and anybody who wants to review it, just send me an email and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you you're an idiot, and it was, really, it, was, it, was really, it was really smart of you to keep your mouth shut for 45 years. <laughs> but I do, I do have a feeling that, that there is no proof of anything, but I think in my case there's a lot of literary evidence that supports my memories and that can show sort of continuity of personality. So anybody that wants to help me on that, that would be great. Just let me know by, by email. And the reason that you're here is because I figure you have at least a little goodwill for me. <laughs> Probably not a whole lot, but a little, little goodwill. So I'm relying on that. For those who only have a, a tiny amount of goodwill, you'll help me, help me keep that secret for the next 45 years. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to do, uh, though, uh, at the end of this is to, to thank the Commonwealth Club. See, uh, I've used the Commonwealth Club for the last 20 some years as uh, my forum, yeah. just, just like the ancient Greek forum. Um, and, and they actually call them forums here. You know, I run the Humanities Forum. I thought that was too, too charming when somebody introduced me to the club back in 2002. Um, and in those 25 years or so, um, I've done 100, uh, because of the pandemic, I've done over 100 live stream author interviews. I've done over 500 podcasts and I've made over 10,000 jokes. <laughs> so so I, I figure I, I use this forum exactly as I used the forums in the past, and I, I, I do think it's interesting, and I wanted to thank Cara and uh, Spencer Campbell and Mark Kirchner and their teams because the, the technology is so much better now <laughs> <laughs> for this kind of thing. And uh, they did a fantastic job, and it'll help me get uh, ideas out and being able to talk to authors and get to meet authors. Something I've, I've really thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, for those of you who are the authors that I've gotten to meet there, there are about 10 or 15 of the authors that I've interviewed here in the audience. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being part of that whole process. And, uh, and we should do a lot more in the future. So thank you for coming. And oh, we have, you know, as I said in the, in the, in the uh, advertisement, you know, we're going to take Marie Antoinette's advice. And I wanted to tell you just one little thing about that. Um, yeah, she never said it. It's, it's apocryphal, right, exactly. <laughs> but I did say it was apocryphal in my ad, didn't I? That, that, was, that was honest advertising, wasn't that? <laughs> um, but there's real cake. And uh, the, the cakes, they, I have three cakes. One's uh, white with white frosting, one's chocolate with chocolate frosting, one's pineapple upside down cake. There's a reason for that. Uh, as, for those of you who know, um, I'm from a big family. I have 11 brothers and sisters. My, my father was one of 11. This is a Midwest Irish Catholic kind of thing. Yeah. My father was one of 11. My mom was one of nine. Uh, my mom's side outdid everybody. Uh, they had, they had, uh, she was one of nine children. One became a nun. <laughs> That's not surprising. No, no children. Uh, and another uh, died early in his 20s. The other seven had 74 children. Yeah. So, so as I was saying before, like with hot and cold, you know, if you had eight children, if you only had eight children, you were a slacker. <laughs> it's true. It's amazing how much abuse that guy got that only had eight kids and gave up. Um, so my grandma, you know, we, I, I have uh, pictures of, of my cousins that my grandma used to have in her thing. One of my aunts and uncles were, were professional photographers, and so they took pictures of us and even movies and stuff like that playing. And the, the children started in like coming in 1943, and I was born in the 10th year, and, and I was about 27, something like that. And uh, so in 1954, there's a framed picture of 35 grandchildren of, of that one couple. Um, 
And that was 1940, 1954 for Christmas. In October of 1960, not even six years later, seven families, there are now 60 grandchildren. That's an average of four children per year. If you were wondering what was causing the baby boom, <laughs> I, there were probably a couple other families like ours, but it didn't take too many. Uh, so, so that's, and my grandma, of course, on her birthday and for other special birthdays and stuff like that, we she lived on a farm, not too surprising. Um, and uh, we would go out to the farm, and so there'd be 30, 40 grandkids running around. And she would always have three sheet cakes, one white with white frosting, one chocolate with chocolate frosting, and a pineapple upside down cake. And you can take little slices of that uh, out there and, and enjoy it, and uh, we, can, we can chat. So thank you very much for coming.